There are many places that we probably like to go, but there is one place that we must go. Some of us like to travel, and some like to go to Gatlinburg, Smoky Mountain area, and spend some time. Others like to go down to the coast to see the ocean. Others like to go into the cities to see the city skylines. And all of those trips are wonderful in their respects. And all of those trips are worth their time as we take them. But there is one trip of which we are on that is worth our entire lives. It's worth our time. It is worth our effort. It is worth our dedication to make sure that we as individuals are on the way to heaven. To make sure that we as fathers and mothers are taking our children to heaven. It's up to us as church families to make sure that every person that worships with us as we gather together on Sundays and as we study on Wednesdays is on the way to heaven. There's going to be no greater place that will ever compare. And there's going to be no life that's worth living such as the Christian life. There's something that's true, though. It's not because of our living that we will be inside of heaven on our own. It's because of God who planned all things. It's because of Jesus who accomplished all things. And it's because of the Holy Spirit of which we can have God's Word that we can see what we must do to be in a right relationship with God. And there's something that's true for us today. It's true of you. It's true of me. Here it is. You can go to heaven. I can go to heaven. We can go to heaven There are so many things in life that distract us from the most important thing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is to go to heaven. The most important thing is not to become a doctor or a lawyer, even though those professions are great. It is not our job in this life to become successful, even though every one of us should strive for success in whatever that we may be doing inside of this world. It is not our objective, it is not our goal to be popular, even though most people want to be popular. But it is within us as we live in this life, the responsibility, the goal that should drive us to be in heaven. Today we're going to talk about a few things that should help us, and I hope that will help us go to heaven. I want us to, as we begin to look at our discussion, talk about the word truth. And the word truth has everything to do with you and me and has everything to do with if we are going to heaven and if we're not. Then I want to look at the word obedience. If we understand what truth is, we need to understand what obedience is. And let me tell you, that has to do with whether we're going to go to heaven or whether we're not. And then finally today, I want us to look at Jesus. And I want us to look at two passages of Scripture, one of which was read for you a moment ago from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And then I want us to go to, and I want us before that, I want us to look at the book of Matthew to see something that Jesus said that will help us understand what Jesus requires of us as we live in this life. So let's begin today by talking about truth. And the word truth is a very interesting word as you approach it inside of Scripture. It is used in the King James Version some 237 times. It's used in its two highest books, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it is used some 41 times in the Psalms. And it is beautiful to see how the psalmist uses the word truth and always dedicates when he's talking about God that truth can only come from God. You see, as we live our lives, there is truth among us But the truth that will always stand will be the truth that comes from God. And for you and me, that is found inside of God's Word. So the psalmist understood that truth truly should be ascribed unto God, the Almighty, the Creator, and the Sustainer. 
But then in the second place used the most inside of the Bible is one in the New Testament. And I find it interesting that it's used in the book of John 27 different times. It's used in several occasions, like in John chapter 1, verse 14, which was talking about Jesus, who said about Jesus, He was full of grace and full of truth. In other words, when Jesus Christ came, He had everything with Him that man needed. Grace, unmerited favor, and truth, the standard that can only come from God. Truth. It's used in John 4, 23 when talking about worship. The Spirit and in truth. It's also used in John 4, 24 about how we must worship Him and it must be done inside of truth. It's also used in passages like John chapter 8, verse 32, which I believe is a very good passage that says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, truth in our lives should be very important. And I know we understand this from a variety of areas. When it comes to our health, we expect the doctors and those that are tending to us to tell us the truth. Because in that area, doesn't your life depend on the truth? What is right? What is factual? What is accurate? See, when it comes to another, a, a number of areas in our lives, we expect the truth. We should expect the truth when we talk about our souls more than anything. As much as we want the physical body to be taken care of, we should want the spiritual body to be found inside of truth. And I'm here to tell you today, we're going to make this conclusion as we get to the end of our lesson, you're only going to find truth right here. I notice what I'm doing. Catch this clearly. You are only going to find truth right here. You don't always find it within men. But you will always find truth within the words of God. And thus brings about one of my favorite noises that exist inside of a worship period. It is the turning of pages of which should be a good noise for us to hear and, and to notice inside of worship. And we're going to see it as we go through some of these things inside of this. What we're seeing inside of the book of John is we're seeing John and truth. And, and we're seeing the beginning of truth. And you see it as you start to open up the book of John. How John talks about Jesus. And how John talks about worship. And how John talks about what Jesus will do in making us free with the truth. And what I want you to do to see this inside of application is I want you to go with me to the book of John. And I want you to open up with me into John chapter 14. Some of my favorite chapters are right here in the book of John, especially a string of chapters. And my favorite section is right here in John chapter 14, going all the way down to verse 18. And we love John chapter 14, and most of us know John 14 because of what happens in John 14, 1 through 6, where Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And we love this phrase right here that Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. We love the beginning of John chapter 14, but John 14 is very important to us because it signifies some things to us. As a matter of fact, as you enter into John 14, you see in John 14, 5, where Thomas asked this question, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Now listen to what Jesus said in verse 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you want to be with the Father, where must you go? You must go to Jesus and go through Jesus to be with the Father. And over and over and over again, inside of John chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, are references going to be made of how we are going to go through the way and enter into and be with the Father. You go in John chapter 14, you follow down into verse 17, and you read this phrase. Picking up in verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, 
neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. It was Jesus in John chapter 14 who was comforting his disciples. There is something that we see Jesus doing more than anything. It is giving comfort. It was Jesus who, with the multitudes, healed them. It was Jesus with the multitudes who spoke words of to, unto them of salvation. It was Jesus with his disciples who guided them. And it was Jesus to his disciples who gave them words which would comfort them. And Jesus understood this, but they didn't quite get it yet in John 14. He was getting ready to go to the cross. In other words, for his disciples, he was not going to be here physically in the earth anymore. Because his death was at hand. And he's preparing them and telling them the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is going to come. And the, that's going to be the Spirit of truth. So you see inside of John chapter 14, there's a lot to do with truth. You fall into John chapter 15. And you have Jesus as you begin John chapter 15 and verse 1 who talks about the vine and the branches. And, and anything that's not a part of the vine is going to be cut off and it's not going to survive. But you follow that chapter all the way out. And you find yourself in verse 26. And look at what Jesus does to once again encourage his disciples. He says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send, un or send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, and he shall testify of me. It was Jesus who was saying the Holy Spirit was going to come. He is the Spirit of truth. And he reminds them over and over and over again, that this was going to come. You enter into John chapter 16. And you see inside of John chapter 16 that Jesus once again is talking about truth. You make it into verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It was Jesus who was concerned about truth. And it was Jesus who was concerned about His closest, of whom He was getting ready to leave, that they would understand truth. And thus, as you make your way into John chapter 16, down to verse 13, you read these phrases. How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. I'm here to tell you why John 14 through 18 is my favorite. Because Jesus is taking the time to take care of his disciples. You see the demeanor, you see the attitude, and you see the actions of Jesus with the people of which he loved the most on the world. But you see Jesus with these people over and over and over and over again telling them this is what's going to happen, and he keeps telling them it's going to have to do with truth. I'm here to tell you that truth is important. You and I both know that if I told you today that to save your life, you must go through that door and you chose to go through another door and you died, we would know the truth. Now, I'm not saying we had the power to do that. That's not the case. But Jesus was telling them, here is where the truth is going to come. Here is where the truth is going to be. It is the spirit of truth in which is going to guide them. Truth is very important. And Jesus tells us so far through John chapter 14, 15, and 16, the value of truth. The same is found in John chapter 17, of which had this prayer of which he begins in John chapter 17. And he prays for a host of things. But one of the things that he says inside of this prayer is very important. It's in John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Where's truth, ladies and gentlemen? Jesus is telling us. Jesus prayed about it to the Father. The truth is found inside of his words. And we possess his words before us. And it's up to you and me to open his words to see what God has truly said about truth. As you make your way inside of John chapter 18, you'll see truth again. And it happens that way all the way in John chapter 18, verse 37. In a very intent, very intimate, and very devastating moment, 
not only in the life of Jesus, but in the life of all of humanity. Because you make your way to John chapter 18 and Jesus has already been betrayed, betrayed toward the end. Jesus knew what was coming. He prepared his disciples to know what was happening and it had to do with truth. And I find it interesting in one of the last scenes of his life and especially in this courtroom scene that this is said in verse 37. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know the truth, you will listen to the voice of Jesus. What did Jesus say? We're going to notice verse 38 in just a moment, but what did Jesus say as we go back to John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 in our minds? He was telling his disciples that the spirit of truth was going to come, and that was the comforter, that was the Holy Spirit. And to the apostles, the Holy Spirit was given. And through the Holy Spirit, the words of God were written. And by the Holy Spirit, we have the words of God. What was Jesus saying? I'm going to give you truth. And let me tell you, we learn inside of Scripture that these words will never be destroyed. Truth, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to you and me, is very important. But let us never be like Pilate, who in verse 38 said unto Jesus, What is truth? In other words, let us never be the people who recognize and who try to acknowledge inside of life that truth is subjective. I'll tell you what truth is. Truth is truth. And truth comes from God. And when it comes to you and me going to heaven, let us listen to God so we can know what God expects and not what man expects inside of our lives. There's truth. Not only is there truth inside of the idea of going to heaven, but there's also obedience. Now, obedience is a very interesting phrase. According to Mary, Mary Webster's dictionary, it means an act or instance of obeying. But in the second place, it means this. The quality or state of being obedient. Now, I love that idea there. Because you and I, for periods of time, may obey for periods of time. But we're not talking about temporary, temporarily obeying the Lord this morning. We're talking about a lifetime of obedience. Now, listen. I understand something. And you, I know, understand this. We're not perfect. Every person in this room today possesses the ability to sin. I understand that. And I understand that starts with me, not with you. I understand that as a gospel preacher, I'm not better than you. And you're not better than me. And I understand that every one of us is tested in this life. We all face temptation and sometimes when we're drawn away of our own lust, the book, the book of James tells us, we are enticed and therefore sin is brought about in our lives. But ladies and gentlemen, you and I can be obedient unto God. Though we may fail from time to time, we can be obedient to God. And that has to do with a lot of areas of our lives. One of my favorite passages, probably... My favorite passage inside of Scripture is Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. And it has a lot to do with obedience because it teaches us what obedience is. It's talking about Jesus. And it says, though, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Do you know how you learn to be obedient? You look unto Jesus. Jesus who left heaven, Jesus who left perfection to come to a world of sin and death. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. In other words, the plan that came from the Father. And you see him over and over and over again talking about the Father's plan. 
You remember when Jesus was in Jerusalem about the age of 12, 11 and 12? His parents thought he was with the company. They had gone to Jerusalem to worship. They were on their way back home and they realized he wasn't there. And they go back to get him. And his first response to them was, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Jesus, who was obedient. We've already seen Jesus before Pilate today in John 18. And we know where Jesus is going after he leaves Pilate. He's going to be beaten nearly to death. Then he's going to carry a cross. And then he's going to be put on that cross. All because he was obedient. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that, listen to this, obey him. You see, the word obedience is used in several different areas. Uh, passages like Mark chapter 1, verse 27, and it, but one, one that's very interesting is the book of Romans. Go with it to Romans chapter 10. Because I find this very interesting. A passage that I, I love to quote quite often. Is Romans ten seventeen. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It has to do with obedience. But notice verse 16. Romans 10 verse 16. Where one said, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Did you know that not all people are going to obey in this life? You know, the word obedience that's used in Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 with obey and obedience there is translated a number of different ways. In Mark chapter 1, verse 27, it's translated as the word obey. We obey the Lord. In Romans chapter 10, verse 16, it's the word obeyed. In other words, we understand what that means. In that context, some had not obeyed, but we look at Romans 10, 17, and we learn that we can be obedient unto the Lord. It's a word that means obedient, which we also saw in Hebrews 5, 8, 9, and also in Acts chapter 6, or 6 through 7, that we can be obedient. It's also used in Acts chapter 12, verse 13, and this is where I love how this word is translated a little bit different, to hearken, to listen to think about it, to consider, and then act upon the information that you were given. Do you remember what Jesus said was going to come to the disciples? The Spirit of truth. And through that Spirit of truth, the Word of God was written, and we have it to where we can think about it, where we can consider it, and we have to decide what we're going to do about it. And here's the reality for you and me. We're either going to obey it, or we're going to turn our ears from it. Jesus on many occasions said this phrase, He that hath ears, let him hear. If you want to obey the Lord, open up your ears to the Lord's words. So you have truth, you have obedience, and you also have Jesus. This is where I want you to go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And I want you to see something that Jesus said that should give us great comfort in this life. Matthew chapter 11, picking up in verse 28, it's kind of the tail end section here of what's happening inside of this area. He had given, as you start in chapter 11, he had given an end to some commandments that he had given to his disciples, and he continues to tell them what they need to know and give them information. But look at what happens in verse 28. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, Jesus is telling you and Jesus is telling me and Jesus was telling the original readers of those statements and the original hearers of that statement that we can go to heaven. That we can follow Him. That it is reasonable for us to do that. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that we transform our lives, which is your reasonable service. In other words, you and I both, all of us, can obey the Lord. And I love the ending of verse 30. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus has made it easy for you and me to obey Him. Now, 
Go with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1 is my favorite chapter. I get to use a lot of my favorites this morning. So far, my favorite string of chapters, my favorite passage, and now my favorite chapter. In Acts chapter 2, Peter was preaching a message, and the crowd responds, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You and I must respond to the Lord to be in the Lord. Peter tells them there in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that was in verse 37, repent and be baptized. Ah, the command. Repent and be baptized. To become a Christian, I must change my life. And I must be immersed into Christ. We're going to get to this in just a minute, but I want you to think about this right now. If you're not a Christian in this room, I can assure you two things. Number one, you will have the opportunity in just a moment to signify, to, to, to let it be known that you want to be a child of God. Don't miss that opportunity. But number two, everything else has been taken care of for you. I've already talked to one of our guys who handles their baptistry for us every week, and, and the water level is just right, and everything is set. The pump is on, the heater is on, everything you need is there. Matter of fact, last week someone was baptized, so the towels had been washed. Everything you need is there. If you want to become a child of God, you can be like those in Acts chapter 2. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And you can go into the watery baptism the watery grave of baptism, to come in contact with the blood of Christ. But ladies and gentlemen, baptism is not all that we must do. We must stay with the Lord. And that's 1 John chapter 1 in its entirety. We will look at verses 5 through 10 to help us signify that in our lives. But chapter or verses 1 through 10 help us understand that Jesus, or verses 1 through 5, help us understand that Jesus had come and Jesus was here. And they were bearing witness unto him. And verse 4, I love this. These things we write unto you that your joy may be full. In other words, it's you can know that you can go to heaven. Now pick up with me in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, Jesus, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him, Jesus, is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ the Son cleanses us from all sin, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You see, becoming a child of God is just part of what we are doing in this life. It is dedicating our lives unto the Lord that will make all the difference. And you need to do that when you become a Christian, but you've got to renew that in your mind every day. Because I know every person in this room that's accountable to the Word of God understands that the devil's out to get us. That temptation lurks around every door, and that disaster could strike at any minute. Kelly and I had some friends that we went to see this week. Their two-year-old little boy had gotten in the pool and they didn't know it. And he gave up his life on Friday night. Disaster can strike at any minute. We are just this far away from eternity and we just don't know it. And we live our lives as if it's all okay. But here's the beautiful thing about the Christian life. There's the blood of Jesus Christ. I love that passage there in verse 7. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. Maybe it's you this morning who's in sin. I find it very, very much an imperative of what happens in verse 8 and verse 9 and verse 10. 
if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Remember how we started today? Truth. The truth of the matter is, there's not a perfect person on the face of this earth. That only happened one time when Jesus Christ walked the face of this earth. On his own, he was perfect. Remember, he was tempted, just as we are, yet without sin, the book of Hebrews tells us. You and I are tempted, and sometimes we fail, and thanks be to God for the blood of Christ, because it gives us the assurance that we can go to heaven. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where? Why? Because of the blood. And what's really interesting to me is verse 8, 9, and 10 because verse 8 says if we say we have no sin. Verse 10 says if we say that we have not sinned. In other words, I've got to recognize and you have to recognize that on our own we will not make it because of sin. But because of verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I can know. We can be assured that we can go to heaven. You see, heaven has everything to do with truth. Jesus was the essence of truth. He came in truth. He came with truth. He gave truth. He still is truth. But you and I must decide what we're going to do with truth. Are you going to obey it or are you going to stay away from it? That's a choice that you and I have to understand. And that's a choice that you and I have to make. And we've looked at Jesus today who's told us that we can come into Him. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And we know that because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, that we have access to His blood which continually cleanseth us. And thus, ladies and gentlemen, we can know that we can go to heaven because of truth, because of obedience, because of Jesus. Maybe it's the case for you this morning that you need to become a child of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 that we've already referenced is going to be the standard for you becoming a child of God. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Don't listen to anyone else but God to determine whether you're going to be a Christian or not. Determine what you must do to be a Christian. To determine if you're going to be a Christian. Because Jesus is calling you, will you respond to Him by obeying His words? Hear His word this morning. Have faith in His life. Have faith in this life that you can go to heaven. Be willing to repent of your past sins. As we've already noticed in John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, or verse 8 and verse 10. To repent of your past sins, to confess the name of Christ, and to be immersed into water. Do not let this moment go by without looking at your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you know you must become a child of God and you've not done that yet. No time is like the presence. No time is like the present. The, 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 the now. Because let me tell you, you're not guaranteed another moment. I'm not guaranteed another moment. Not a person in this room is guaranteed another breath. But we have the opportunity to respond this morning. Maybe you're a child of God this morning and you recognize there's something in your life that is amiss. Rely on the blood of Christ. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, that when we need to come home, we can. And that our brethren, our brothers and sisters in Christ can pray for us and God will hear them. And we can be cleansed. We can be forgiven. Bill has picked out a song for us to sing. If you need to become a child of God, if you need to make your life right with the Lord, don't let this day go by without responding. Without making the decision this morning that you're going to go to heaven. I'm telling you, I want to go to heaven, don't you? I want my children to go to heaven. It, it would be a disaster 
we went to heaven and our children didn't. It would be a disaster if our children went to heaven and we weren't there. Evaluate your life because there's only so much time. But for now, we have this moment to respond. Let's stand and sing and respond to Christ.